pleased we are of uh, having this, uh, this seminar today. Every year we try to organize something uh, for the 22nd of March for the World Water Day. And uh, today we have uh, a transboundary water management as a topic, which is really um, a quite stimulating topic. And uh, Animesh is, uh, is virtually back to Venice today. So it's, uh, it's another pressure, a pleasure for us. And uh, Professor Suskinder is, uh, is, uh, is well known everywhere. So it's really nice to be, to be here all together today. Also, you can see how many logos we have in this uh, brochure. Uh, which is a sign of the interest that we have uh, in different inst institutions uh, uh, around for this uh, for this uh, for this seminar. But uh, um, as I mentioned, uh, we are here today also because it's the World Water Day, and uh, and uh, for those uh, uh, teaching environmental economics, uh, which is my case. Uh, valuing water is indeed uh, an extremely stimulating uh, topic and uh, it's really uh, an exercise that we all attempt uh, in different ways and obtaining different results. So valuing water is, is the topic, is the, the motto of the, the World Water Day of uh, 2021. And also taken from, from the UN Water website, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's quite... Um, interesting to see that they, 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 they start by saying uh, water means different things to, to different people. And that's, uh, that's uh, the, probably the initial uh, challenge of, of valuing water. I, just for those of you that are not familiar with, for the students in particular that are not familiar with water issues, uh, um, the, uh, uh, a few facts and figures that they took uh, from the freshly released uh, World Water Development Report of today, um, the figures that you can see here, no? I mean, like for, for example, the global fresh water use, which has kept increasing year by year over the uh, last hundred years. Um, and that's a result of the, the, the combination of uh, various drivers, uh, population growth, economic development, and, but also shifting of consumption pattern, for example. Um, when we speak about water, what it uses, we always uh, probably focus first of all on agriculture because uh, it is well known as the main user uh, of water. Uh, we, in order to, to, be, to use the right term, we have to speak in terms of water withdrawals in this case, not really water consumption, we must be careful. But in any case, uh, uh, these 69% of global water withdrawals that are allocated to agriculture is, is quite a shocking maybe uh, figure for those that are not familiar with, this, uh, with these issues. But also even more the fact that uh, these, uh, these uh, percentage could, could reach up to 95% in some developing countries. Um, which is which is something that tells us how, how how relevant what the water is for any kind of a, of, a, of economic activities. But if we look at the the GDP uh, in this in these facts and figures of the UN Water, we read that uh, globally uh, agricultural accounts uh, only uh, uh, about four percent of the gross domestic uh, product, but but it's using uh, uh, almost seventy percent of water. So one could derive from these figures the idea that water is not really a great value because we, most of it is used for uh, some production that really do not have a, 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 a such a relevance for our gross domestic product but I'm, I'm sure that everybody can easily understand that the GDP is really not enough to to understand what the value of water is and um, and so let me but I don't want to, to waste too much time with this introduction before giving the floor to floor to Larry and, and Animesh. Um, uh, let me in any case, point out a few important things. So, so this idea of the value of water and how the value of uh, the notion of value valuation is, is intrinsically subjective. So this idea of determining the true value of water is really something that uh, should be out of our consideration, but in many cases that we are struggling to find this, uh, uh, 
uh, impossible notion of uh, the true value of water. Well, instead, what we can do is simply to assess and determine multiple values of water in different circumstances. Um, knowing very well that we, for example, with economic means, uh, with economic instruments, uh, we can assess and determine some components of this uh, theoretically even infinite value of water mm, uh, based, for example, on use and on use values. But there are, there are other values that we know already that we cannot quantify and they are associated to, to water and they are very important for for water, and even if, if we stay within the, 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 the economic uh, field, I mean, uh, we can uh, arrive eventually to find some different values mm, for water for different purposes. But even the same volume of water may have different values, and, and, and as a consequence of this, it may have different prices. So, um, this is really something that uh, I think uh, uh, is a, a for me at least, a, a very stimulating starting point for the seminar of today. Because then, when we understand uh, the crucial uh, uh, value of water for, for human beings, how, then, when we have understood how difficult it is in a way to determine, to, to, to assess the water, knowing very well that the water does have a, a, a value, and, and that we would like to, to assess, so having, having identified this, we can then use this as a key for understanding some phenomena that we observe globally. And uh, if we, for example, go into each of, of these, of, of, the, of the global countries, uh, we, we can uh, uh, observe and explore how, for example, uh, water is valued in different ways in different countries. And how, for example, the evaluation of water becomes very challenging whenever we touch some critical issues, like, for example, uh, when we understand that water is, is to be considered a human right. And therefore, even, even the same volume of water that I mentioned before uh, can be segmented in different components. Uh, for example, the very first component, being a human right, should have no, no price, for example, but still having a value. And, uh, and because of all these, these problems, it's also very easy uh, to understand that water having a value, and a value that could even be infinite, uh, can be the source of conflicts. Different views in this, indeed about the value, but also uh, in general conflicts uh, between different users of water, uh, which is, which is uh, typically in any place when water becomes scarce. And uh, this can be within the community, within a same single community, but also it may happen in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, in between countries. And then we move to, to what uh, Animesh is currently studying at, uh, at MIT. So this idea of water uh, to be uh, studied in, in, in its, uh, its uh, transboundary, uh, transboundary uh, 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 um, dimension and, uh, in, and we do have an issue of transboundary dimension because uh, the water cycle does not follow human boundaries. If we overlay uh, uh, the, uh, the boundaries of water, meaning uh, the watersheds, uh, the boundaries of water cycle, they never coincide with, uh, with human boundaries. And this is an issue that makes, for example, the existence of, uh, of, uh, of upstream and downstream countries where we find indeed all these possible conflicts. So this is, these are really the few words that I wanted to, to share with you uh, today. And um, I will now uh, give uh, uh, the floor to, uh, to Larry and I will stop uh, sharing my, my, my screen now. And, uh, uh, well, the challenge now is to introduce uh, Larry, which is uh, uh, quite difficult indeed, a uh, Ford Professor of uh, Urban and Environmental Planning at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where he has been for many years, but also I could mention the Vice Chair of the Program of Negotiation at Harvard Law School, uh, the Director of Science Impact Collaborative at MIT again, 
um, so many, many different things. But what I, I think is also peculiar and very important in the case of Larry is uh, that he has also a very long experience uh, um, in, uh, out, uh, out of the academia uh, because he is, in fact, one of the most experienced uh, public and environmental dispute mediators, which is, uh, I think, the right, uh, the right uh, role to play when we when we move to 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 discuss uh, uh, the transboundary dimension of water. So, Larry, if, if you like, uh, I I would really like to give you the floor right now, and uh, waiting anxiously for your for your speech. Uh, thank you so much, Carlo, and thank you, Animesh, for helping to arrange today. Um, I'm very glad uh, to uh, virtually meet uh, many of you. I don't recognize your names, um, but there are some friends uh, who've decided to sit in and I hope they will also feel comfortable uh, raising questions uh, as, uh, as you heard. Um, at any point in the chat, um, I would prefer to stop and take a question related to what I'm saying uh, than to put it off for uh, 20 or 30 minutes until it no longer feels relevant to you and I finished whatever I was going to say, I'd rather not work that way. So please raise questions along the way. Um, I'll talk for about 20 or 30 minutes and then uh, certainly uh, open to uh, moving the discussion whatever way might be interesting uh, to some of you. Um, I begin with shared waters. Every river is shared. And sometimes it's shared just by some people who live next to each other. Sometimes it's shared by people in different communities that are juxtaposed next to each other. Sometimes it's shared by different municipalities, regions, state governments. And often, many of the great rivers are shared by countries. So when we talk about transboundary water management, we're talking about the management of shared waters. Rivers, ocean even is a shared water, lakes, shared waters. Now, you'd think that people who share water would just get together, say to each other how much they need, explain that that's what they'll be taking, and everyone would be uh, aware of who was going to take how much water. They might say when they expect to take the water. They might say how they expect to extract the water. And um, if you had enough water, they just let each other know. And that would be that. But if you don't have enough all the time for what people want to use it for, and if the way one wants to use it makes it hard for the others, then the conversation becomes difficult. And then there's the question of who should be in the conversation. If a dozen countries on the Nile are all going to use part of the Nile at some point as it flows all the way up uh, to Egypt, it should just be the presidents or prime ministers of the countries who get together to have this conversation of how much water they need and when they're going to take it and how they're going to take it? Or might they want to have some people who are more expert? on water, be in the conversation, if not have the conversation. And maybe the users, the people, the companies, the communities, the groups, want something to say about whatever is decided about the use in the future of the water. So it's not clear who needs to be in the conversation about the management of shared waters. And there's another strange part to this story, many versions of this story, where whoever gets together 
countries often for great rivers, they talk, they make an agreement, and they write it down. And they design a treaty. And all the signatories to the treaty sign and say, uh, this is what we'll do. Here's how much will go to different groups. Here's when and how they can take the water out. Here's when and how they can put water or other residuals in. Sign here. Hundreds of treaties. The problem is, take the example of the treaty between the United States and Canada over the Columbia River. The treaty is signed and it says, we'll meet again in 50 years to see how it's going and whether we want to change the treaty. Literally, 50 years. Now, it happens that was three years ago and they haven't been able to meet to talk much about, well, what are we doing right now? The treaty doesn't apply anymore. It's over. And one side wants to change the treaty one way, and the other side wants to change the treaty another way. So it's not such an easy question. And in the United States, the state governments of Washington and Montana and Idaho, all of whom are implicated in how the water from the Columbia River is shared and used and priced, all would like the treaty to change. And all of the indigenous communities, the Native American tribes, say, well, now, finally, 50 years later, we can do this fairly. This was our water, you realize, and we would like it all back. And the governors of the states and the federal government, the national government in Washington, and then the provincial governments in Canada and the national government in Canada and the First Nations in Canada, they would all like something to say. So getting an agreement, and whether it will go another 50 years, I don't know, but even getting into a discussion has been a discussion. How could you make an agreement about how you're going to use the water for 50 years? I think everyone is aware that the amount of water available in any given season or in any given year is now being affected by climate change. So if we have to allocate the water according to an agreement 50 years old, there isn't going to be the same amount of water. No matter, and, and you can find with the Nile, countries saying we, we want our share, that we have an agreement. And you add up everybody's share, and there's not that much water in the river. And each one says, well, we don't care. We want our water. And you'd say, well, somebody, somebody should get them together, explain that there's not as much water because of climate change, acknowledge that there's different numbers of people living and working and using water differently in each country than there were years ago, big migration, big urban population growth in Ethiopia, they would like to build a dam and keep the water that comes by their waterfront for their use because they have many more people and they want hydroelectric power. So excuse us, but we're gonna extract more water as it goes by for our use, our water for our use as it goes by. And Egypt, which is three countries up after South Sudan, Sudan, you get to Egypt, has the Aswan Dam. Well, if they build the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which they have, if they build that dam, not very far away, you have the, what was the largest dam in Africa, 95% of all water used for everything in Egypt goes over the Aswan Dam. If you build the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, and depending on how much, how you run it, how much water you take to fill it, when you fill it, how much you let out for multiple growing seasons, which you could now do, 
you're not only going to affect South Sudan and Sudan, which could be a positive effect if you give them water in a season where they couldn't grow before. But as far as Egypt's concerned, you're reducing the flow over the Aswan. That's 95% of all of our water. You can't do it. And they say, yes, we can. Now, you understand something about transboundary water management. Who is getting together to talk about what? What form will their agreement take? To whom will it apply? And this would be the same whether I'm talking about a lake, right? Israel and Jordan have the only peace treaty that, that Israel has with a, with a Middle Eastern country. And a big focus of that peace treaty is water. Turns out the Jordan River, which for those of us when we were children and read about the Jordan River in biblical texts, you saw a giant wide river. Now I can step across it in many places. So Jordan has way more people than it had in historic days. They've even taken a million refugees from Iraq. And now they would need water, please. Well, the treaty, which was a brilliant treaty 25 years ago when it was first passed, forget its political importance. The treaty said, there's this lake, Lake Tiberias. And when it rains in the wet season, a lot of extra water. So Israel said, we'll keep water for Jordan in Lake Tiberias. We won't use it. We'll protect it. And we'll help you build waterway to take the water to the Jordan, to Jordan and the Jordan at different seasons when you need it. No cost. We'll, we'll protect it for you, and it will keep the lake ecologically sound because it will have a high level when it needs it. And we will tap that water for you, and a portion of it will go to Jordan when it needs it in the dry season. And they signed an agreement, 25 year agreement, the only political agreement between Israel and any of its Arab neighbors. Well, but Jordan has way more people now than it had 25 years ago. And there's less water. And relationships between Israel and Jordan are strained as they've always been, but particularly strained. And Jordan has a million refugees Could somebody please help them have a conversation about what to do about sharing the water? Jordan's always been uncomfortable with the fact that Israel controls its water in Lake Tiberias. Israel said, we're holding it for you. And when you need it, we'll send it down the waterway that we built. Don't worry, we'll do it. There's not a lot of trust. It's not that Israel hasn't done that, but there's a worry in Jordan that at any moment Israel might decide not to. And I could take you on a tour from the Colorado River between US and Mexico through the Amazon. I could take you all around the world through the Mekong, the Ganges. All of these shared rivers have very, very fragile agreements. Many of the agreements are utterly out of date. Many of the agreements never had in them any kind of commitment to adaptation and modification to reflect changing demand or supply. They just assumed the world would stay the same with regard to water. 
none of them have enforcement mechanisms that mean anything. None of them talk about what Carlo would be interested in talking about, which is what's the price of water? I mean, if you're making a deal to share water with someone, should you promise them that you're really going to make it available at a manageable cost or no cost because it's a right to some, all of the people in your country, or is that nobody else's business? Should you have to price the water at, in a way that means it will be used efficiently? Do, does each country downstream have an expectation that upstream countries will only use as much water as they really need in an efficient way, which usually means that they will price it in a way that will balance supply and demand? Or is that nobody else's business? Should transboundary water just look at the volume of water and the time of the year and the way it's extracted? Or should it look at the price? Should countries that take any water out of a shared river have to pay for it back into a joint fund to maintain the river? They don't now. Now, in addition to water price, we have concerns about water quality. Somewhere along the river or to the lake, somebody didn't take care and managed to allow pollution either once or continuously into the body of water, into the shared water. They may not have said anything to the other countries about it. And suddenly, everybody finds the water is polluted. It might still be usable for some uses because of the kind of pollution or the amount of pollution, but it might be absolutely unusable for some of the uses that some of the countries want to make of it. Well, who's in charge of fixing that? Who's in charge in the first place of monitoring the water quality? Is that up to each one when they extract it? They all need a little monitoring process from the point at which they take it out and nobody monitors what's in? Should there be monitoring all along all of the edges that might feed into this shared body to make sure pollution isn't going in? So someone monitoring what pollution is going in, someone interpreting how dangerous that is relative to different uses and getting that information out to potential users or people who are affected by its use. Who's responsible for repairing the damage? Who's responsible for saying, oh, can't use the water this year, it's too polluted. What do you mean it can't use the water this year? We'll die. Well, but it's polluted. You're not going to use it for agriculture. You're not going to use it for domestic use. You're not going to use it at all. Then there's another issue, which is if people take out too much water at various points in time along the river, you will destroy the flow of the river you will destroy the natural ecological balance in the river. This is usually represented as what share of the water belongs to nature in every shared water body, water body to maintain that water system, right? Everybody knows what happened as day zero approached in South Africa. The bodies of water that fed the water supply were so reduced by drought, you, you couldn't drink the water. You, it was not enough to take because if you took it out, then it would stop functioning altogether as a water body. So you have socio-ecological demands on the water body. And somebody needs to speak for nature and say, 
nature says don't take any more of this water out during this dry season or you will never be able to use the system again. It will dry up. Who represents nature in that conversation? How does the changing demand of nature's requirements get expressed in the agreement and the administration of the agreement? So transboundary or shared waters require conversation and attention. And part of our problem globally is we haven't figured out how to create effective institutional arrangements for purposes of allocating, monitoring, repairing, and protecting shared waters. The work that Anamesh and that I and others do looks at the processes by which all of those difficult conversations and decisions might be made. When someone says, well, we'll have a shared water management regime and all the users will get together and they'll make an agreement. What's the big deal? Well, I hope you understand all the questions that make that a big deal. And creating the institution with the capacity and the authority and the accountability so that there's trust is hard. And we can draw on so many different disciplines, and particularly the humanities, given our sponsorship today, to begin to think creatively about who should be in what kind of discussion, when, where, and how, to produce some set of institutional arrangements and fund them and staff them so that shared waters can be monitored, can be maintained, can be allocated, not just once, but appropriately over time, particularly in the face of climate change. I'm only going to say five more minutes of things about what we have learned with regard to the processes for addressing these kinds of problems. And while the, I would be the first one to tell you that context matters most of all for making specific decisions about what to do and how to do it, I am talking generally about processes that create a menu of choices that then have to be shaped by the people and institutions in each context, not one model for all purposes for water management. The history of the relationships amongst the parties, the ecological history of the place, all of those matter in designing something specific. But in general, I'm going to talk about three or four things we think we have learned over the last decade. Um, I have uh, books and articles uh, that I've written on, on this subject that I'd be glad to supply, but let me just try in a few sentences to summarize some things that we have learned. The first you heard Carlo describe uh, in passing, which is the design of institutions to manage shared waters cannot be aligned or limited to the boundaries of existing political or geopolitical entities. The, the, the socio-ecological systems appropriate for bounding water management or management of shared waters don't coincide with national boundaries, state boundaries, provincial boundaries, district boundaries, metropolitan boundaries, city boundaries. We got all of them and none of them are right for purposes of managing water. 
So you have to have, it's not an algorithm, but you have to have some idea of what process of conversation amongst whom with what information and what expertise you're going to have for purposes of designing appropriate boundaries to build new institutional arrangements to manage shared waters. We, there's one thing we think we know that don't look to existing geopolitical boundaries to set the shape of the institution that you're going to operate with. Secondly, I think we know that all relevant stakeholders need to be given a meaningful role in making these decisions about allocation and monitoring and so on. How you do that? Big question mark. Who speaks for farmers along one part of a river with regard to the allocation of water between states or between uses? But you, you, you can't avoid the problem by not addressing it. You, you have to have some way of engaging stakeholder groups in choices. They may not all have uh, equal authority, but you have to find some way of engaging them. Third thing we think we know is that water security of one country can almost never be secured by that country on its own. You want to increase your water security? Improve the water security of your neighbors, if you're talking to countries. If each country or if each political entity tries to secure its own water security by grabbing what it needs and protecting it, all that will do is diminish everybody's water security. The only way to enhance water security is through a collaborative process that seeks to improve everybody's security. And for many political actors, that's a conundrum. They think my constituency is right here in my country. I have to show them that I'm building what I need to build to take the water I need to take to guarantee them the water they need. Not realizing that all of that is creating demand, unmet demand from their neighbors who are then likely to want to engage in some battle to get their water back. So water security of one depends on water security of all. Finally, and this is, a, I'm going to say it, it's going to sound a little different from what uh, Carlos first point was uh, in terms of uh, his first slide. I think water is an endlessly flexible, not a fixed resource. If you can use the same water over and over and over again, you make more water. If every water, every bit of water taken by one country used for one use, were then recaptured and put back, we have an infinite supply of water. And there's a cost to trying to do that. There's technology that's needed to do that. But it turns out we can make water not just by desalination, which historically has been problematic because of the energy required to desalinate. Now we have solar powered desalination that's reasonably efficient, but we still have a huge amount of brine, salty water left at the end, which is not being managed effectively. So that is a second order concern as we move to try to desalinize water of various kinds. Also, it's, it, it's like the nuclear power of energy. It's really expensive as compared to other ways. I mean, there are there are uh, uh, indigenous communities along the coast, both uh, in Africa and in uh, Latin America, that just put some poles up and some string across between the poles and some buckets at the bottom. And when it makes fog every morning, the fog is, catches on the string and it drips down and they have water, perfectly clean water very low cost. 
So you have very high cost ways of reclaiming or reusing water, and you have very modestly priced ways. But water is flexible. The water that is the byproduct of an agricultural use in one place can in fact be cleaned and reused for any domestic use at a cost. And so these are questions of technology and cost, but no, that they change the calculation about the supply. And we know supply is gonna to continue to be a worse and worse problem. It's the last thing I wanna say, because throughout all of time, I'm told by my earth science colleagues, roughly the same amount of water has fallen from the sky on the earth every year. It may not, you may have droughts, right? It's the same when we talk about climate change, we say the earth is getting hotter. People say, not hot here, right now I've got snow. You say, no, 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 we're talking about an average across the whole thing. Well, roughly the same amount of water, potable water has fallen. But if it's not drinkable because it falls in ways that don't reach to where people are, where it's polluted by the time it gets to them, where it's not in a place where they are who need it, and the cost of moving it is very high, where the system of rights we have created allocates some of the water that falls to people who don't need it. Our problem of water in the Western part of the United States is we have a legal system just for the Western part of the United States, not the Eastern part, a whole separate legal system that says, hey, once it was yours, it's always yours. It's not public, it's yours. You don't need it, so you can do what you want with it. You wanna sell it, fine. You don't wanna sell it, fine, it's yours. Senior water rights an incredibly inequitable legal principle. But we have sections of California where people have way more water than they need and no commitment to sharing it physically, financially anyway with anybody and other places with no water. So you have to think about legal rights in the systems, and they're different all over. When you think about why, even if there's roughly the same amount of water falling on the earth, it doesn't mean that with increasing population, increasing urbanization, you're going to have the water where you need it, in a form you need it, used in a way that's most efficient at a price that people can afford in a way that reflects rights. And thus, we have conflict in water management. I'll stop at that and happily take any questions. There was, <clears throat> there was one question in the chat that was a little bit upstream when you were talking, but I didn't want to interrupt you. And it is, what if the UN would provide a framework for content and process that could be used for shared waters? And it comes from Franz Ethers. Yeah, well, Franz is just being provocative. Uh, we're very good friends. Uh, yeah, when they finish the climate change treaty that works, we can take a water treaty and start on that. I, I think the big issue is the variation in law, the variation in supply and demand, um, and you would have all of the same problems of shared water versus water that just is in one place. Would it all be governed? Would it be governed by this global treaty if you could make one and if you could enforce it? Um, I'm not optimistic. Um, I've written several books uh, under the name Environmental Diplomacy uh, and looked at the first uh, couple dozen of the most important global treaties, uh, they're not going to inspire confidence when you look at what those regimes are. Either the fact that countries like the United States is not a party 
to many global treaties or like the fact there's no enforcement mechanism in any of them that means anything or like the fact that they're only adopted when countries voluntarily agreed to adopt them and nobody can force anyone to do anything and with a common resource like it's the climate change problem it's really hard to figure out what's a fair allocation of both the the resource and the cost of maintaining and managing the system to be allocated among countries so um, i'm not counting on the un um, we do have some treaties for the um, great rivers of the world they are woefully inadequate um, i would put my energies into trying to improve them for the clusters of country and the clusters of stakeholders for whom each river and they're often beyond one river basin um, requires participation rather than trying to get a global treaty um, I Barbara, see that you, you, you're going to call on people for me, Barbara? Uh, yes, uh, I see that Carlo Giupponi raised his hands, which is a little bit against our rules because he should also write a question if he has one in the chat. And then we have an extremely long question. I'm not sure I should read it all or not in these cases. Uh, maybe you can see it and you... I can see it, yeah. Um, I, I also ask participants to write short questions. <laughs> um, so let's see. Um, I don't know if what I should read it all, but thank you for organizing this event and thanks to Professor Larry for the interesting talk. I am the facilitator of the Blue Peace team within the World Youth Parliament of Water. We work a lot on the Blue Peace Index in collaboration with international organizations and some of the case studies such as Senegal River Basin could be considered as efficient, as efficient while others, for example, the Nile River, the issue is still here between Egypt, Sudan and Ethiopia. But overall, I agree with Professor Larry about giving interest to water quality. And here the problem is purely decision making because each country invests in water quality in terms of in infrastructure, depending on how much this investment will grow up the national GDP. Thus, here's the question. We were thinking maybe a regional economic model that recommends water policies taking into consideration the impact on transboundary countries GDP could be a solution. Yeah. So um, again, uh, Carlo can speak to this as can probably many of the others who are on this, um, on this Zoom. Um, a, a regional model will allow you to model what would be efficient. What would be the price and allocation scheme that would let you get the most out of the water in the region? I'm, I have no doubt we could model it. The problem is that efficiency isn't the only concern. And once we say that equity is a concern, and once we say that history and rights are a concern, and once we say that nature's interests need to be represented, but of course they aren't in the way in which we calculate price, an economic model won't help make the decisions it can inform decisions if you care about efficiency but all of the other questions with regard to regional allocation amongst countries you shouldn't be rewarded because you have the largest gdp with more water you should get gdp because that's the amount you need slash is fair we should only get water if you can show you use it efficiently. You should only get water if you show you distribute it fairly. What's fairly? That's very different in different countries. I will take an enormous risk with an international audience and extend my answer and anticipate several of the questions that come after by pointing to the fact that for a period of time, Israel and Palestine had an idea of how to manage the shared water that's in the state of Israel and is in an aquifer that crosses over between Israel and Palestine. Now, in most recent years, 
There's no joint management. There's no discussion of joint management. You can't even have a meeting to talk about the possibility of joint management. But there was a period in which even though power in the political sense of controlling the resource was vested in Israel's hands, there was joint management. It, it, and in the same way that you have between US and Mexico, 100 years of a battle over the allocation of water from the Colorado, from the US to Mexico, 100 years. We had US government agreements to give a greater share of the water to Mexico that were not honored and fulfilled. And then after 100 years, we have a new agreement. It's not even a function of who the president is on either side of the border. We have a new agreement because local officials, scientists, and stakeholders got together to drive the making of a new regime, of a new treaty, and pushed together up on both sides of the border to their national officials who then agreed to and adopted this new regime. One of my close friends and former students, Bruno Verdini, has a most wonderful book about how that could happen after a hundred years. V-I-R-D-I-N-I, -I -I, MIT Press. Um, terrific story of how that could happen. My point being that at different points in time, we know that it's possible for the less powerful to negotiate with the more powerful. Right? Again, sorry, I'm trying to anticipate another of the questions that's on here. Um, there was a period a, a long time ago where um, uh, India showed up on Nepal's doorstep and said, uh, we need water and we're taking it. And oh, and by the way, we have an army and you don't. And there was no more discussion. India took the resources that it, water resources that it need. And 30 years later, they came back and they say, well, we're growing. We need even more water. Uh, you have the water. So we're just telling you we're taking it, but we'll build some infrastructure to get the water to us that might also be helpful to you. And they came back another 20 years later and they said, it's us again. Uh, we need way more water because of the rate at which we're going. Uh, don't forget, we have an army and you don't. And, and, but we'll pay you a little bit for the water we take. And when they tried a fourth time and they came and they said, uh, we're here again. Uh, we need, we're going to take more water. And Nepal said, no, you're not. And India said, which part about we have an army and you don't? Have you forgotten? And Nepal said, our friend China says, we don't have to listen to you anymore. That's geopolitics of water. When we say who's powerful and who's not, how can there be agreements between the less powerful and the more powerful? The geopolitics of shared waters involves coalitions. The emergence of coalitions changes the balance of power with regard to water. But I don't think we can model our way in any location where there's shared water to a solution to all the problems I listed. We can only negotiate our way to a solution once you can agree on who should be at the table in that negotiation, what technical input they need, and how they can generate an informed consensus because the water security of one depends on the water security of all. Sorry for the long answer, Barbara. Um, if um, uh, Mr. Hossain agrees, we can then go to Roberta Shortino's question. And also I suggest that the, the questions we have on the chat right now remain the last that we will take if we want to leave enough space for Animesh gain also part of the of the conversation. I hope it's okay for you. So the question is, what do you think about big companies such as Nestlé making profits from water and exploiting water resources in developing countries like Nigeria, etc.? Um, I think it's a, a, a very very troublesome phenomenon when private interests 
or even worse, sovereign wealth funds of nations, which are not part of the national government decision making, come and buy huge areas of land in developing countries and in the process acquire the water rights that go with that land, right? You're not gonna have chocolate without water. You're not gonna have Coke without water, Coca-Cola without water. So big companies and national entities buying big areas in order to get the water rights so that companies or their own entities can take advantage of the water availability if they're willing to buy the land that has the water. And uh, this throws completely out of whack internal distributions of water within countries. On the other hand, those decisions are made by the national governments, not by international entities. They're made by ultimately the decision to sell the land and take money for the land and give the water rights with the land made by national entities. And so the problem for people in areas that are underserved or cheated out of their water in different countries is their own national government has said, oh, well, Nestle's offered to buy this land. Nobody important is using it. We'll sell it to Nestle. Oh, and it comes with water. Well, and what they produce goes away. It goes out of the country and the water is not reused. It isn't reclaimed. It's not extra water. So I think it's very problematic, but these are national water policy questions. I don't think they're gonna be regulated by international forces who are upset about what national governments are doing by selling or leasing land to sovereign wealth funds or to large corporations. Um, Carlo Giupponi has a question that goes back to the process for decisions. So what will the outcome be? Uh, a treaty or an international institution maybe? Yeah, um, I don't expect there to be an international treaty on water. I mean, we have international water law agreements now that took many, many decades that lay out some principles of how water from an international legal standpoint um, ought to be valued and thought about and managed. Um, they have very little direct effect unless an individual country internalizes those international sort of tr treaty standards into its own law. And so I don't expect international institutions to help solve the problem of shared boundaries, the shared water. Uh, I do think if you take the Nile, right, we have a Nile Basin Commission. It hasn't been particularly effective. It has some agreements within that commission's responsible boundaries, we have the problems of the White Nile, of the, of the Ethiopian Grand, uh, Renaissance, Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam and the battle between Ethiopia, Sudan, South Sudan, they, although they don't have much to say about anything, and Egypt. And the, but the Basin Commission is not, to, not able to do anything to settle the battle between a few of its member countries. So um, expanding it to more countries in more area, I don't think is gonna help. It's hard enough to do it for the rivers. We have the Mekong River Commission. Uh, it has done some terrific things on small scale at different points along the Mekong, but China refuses to be told what to do by the Mekong Commission. And China operates independently of the commission. So, um, there isn't going to be some other international force that makes China adhere to agreements generated by the Mekong Commission. Uh, so I'm not optimistic there'll be international entities that will help us solve these problems. And um, there is one more comment from Franz Evers. I was involved in the International Rhine Commission. As far as I know, the system works fine now, or is there other information? No, no, the story of the Rhine is a positive one, and there are some other periods in time for other rivers where working agreements have functioned just fine. 
And so the problem is, that's why I'm optimistic that it's possible if you bring all stakeholders together and search for a shared management system that transcends municipal or national boundaries, it's possible. But most places haven't gotten to that point or haven't been able to stay at that point. There's been very little shared learning from one part of the world to another in terms of what works and how to work better. Uh, everybody can contribute to really trying to understand. This is Adamesh's work. Look at all those agreements. Look at what's in them over you know, hundreds and hundreds of years. Look at all those agreements. What's worked? What's been effective? How have agreements changed over time to reflect changing conditions? So, I mean, I want to make sure Animesh gets now the chance to expand on these things or take them in a different direction. Yes, I hope I wasn't too bossy in saying that we were not taking more questions for you because I'm sure many people had comments. I just read thanks for your answers. And maybe Carlo Giupponi would like to introduce Animesh Gain. I'm not sure. We didn't say this before. Um, Animesh was one of our best and more productive uh, students at our PhD in climate change. So it, it, I don't have to say more than this. Uh, he has a new life now in Boston, so I'm curious to know about it. That is it. Thanks. Thanks, Carlo. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Larry, for your um, nice talk. And yeah, so um, let me share my screen. Uh, can you see see my screen? Yes. Yeah. So, thanks again for for um, this um, nice initiative. Uh, specifically, um, today is the World Water Day, and um, uh, as Carlo uh, already mentioned, the theme for today is uh, regarding valuing water. So, my talk is is uh, going mainly on um, how we can create more value on water resources in terms of um, transboundary um, or shared water uh, resources and um, how we can go beyond um, uh, zero sum game and how we can resolve conflict. So mainly I will talk on Brahmaputra um, basin context. Um, and then, um, yeah, so um, I, I will try to um, uh, explain the source of conflicts in the Brahmaputra river basin and how these conflicts can be mitigated kind of um, theoretical and empirical investigation. So as uh, this project is part of a um, EU-funded project and I uh, acknowledge uh, European Commission for, for this project and yeah, the host institute is um, Kapuska University of Venice and um, MIT through joint collaboration. And yeah, joint collaboration with Carlo and um, Larry so um, as I mentioned, uh, first I will um, describe mainly the extent of water conflicts in transboundary river basin and um, how complex this transboundary water basin is and why the negotiated approach is needed to resolve this kind of complex um, problems and um, what are the sources of conflicts in Brahmaputra River basin and how we can resolve those conflicts. So first, I would like to start with this uh, statement made by the uh, World Bank Vice President uh, is, is Ismail Sirigaldin in 1995, who stated that the wars for the next century will be about water. Also, the um, former um, UN Secretary General Kofi Annan also stated that the fierce competition for fresh water. Uh, may well become a source of conflict and wars in the future. So uh, do you agree with this statement regarding the future water war? The, by water war is, is um, the extreme level of conflict among riparian countries uh, due to uh, shortage or degradation of quantity or quality. So in this figure is a hypothetical river basin called Indopotomia. And in the 
yeah, uh, you can see the upstream alpha and, um, and gamma and also downstream beta. So in order to, uh, in, in order to create water war in this uh, kind of uh, hypothetical river basin, the condition, the strategic condition needs to be the upstream country, in this case alpha, needs to be, um, uh, needs to launch a project that hampers quantity or quality in the downstream. And the downstream beta needs to be regional hegemon and um, launch an initial attack to destroy the upstream facilities. So this should be the strategic uh, condition. And such strategic condition in the current transboundary basin context is very little. And one of the example is the Nile. And um, Larry already mentioned the conflict between Egypt and Ethiopia. So in this case, you can see that the, um, Egypt is the, uh, at least um, Egypt was the more powerful country in the basin in terms of power relation. And Ethiopia was the upstream countries and most water, uh, more than 80% water are coming from the Ethiopia. And um, so this is the situation where war, water war can happen. But you know, until now, there was there were several threats between um, um, Egypt and Ethiopia, but no no water uh, happened because you know the the cost of war is is much more higher than than the negotiation or or um, uh, conflict resolution. So in my case, in the case of Brahmaputra river basin, uh, how, how uh, to, to what extent we can expect conflict? So in this case. China in the upstream countries, then um, uh, Bhutan and India also um, becomes the middle stream and then Bangladesh is the downstream country. So in terms of power relation here, Bangladesh is less powerful than India and China. Um, so uh, in this case, the, the, the extent of conflict might not lead to the severe conflicts in terms of in terms of this, um, this uh, strategic conditions that we, that we explain. So um, here I, I wanted to mention some empirical works made by Professor Aaron Wolf at the, at the um, 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 Oregon State University, uh, where he developed a database on, on water conflicts and cooperation. So he tried to categorize uh, the level of conflict um, kind of pH scale. So from minus seven to plus seven. So minus means the highest level of conflict. So minus seven is the formal declaration of war. And um, the zero is the no conflict or is kind of neutral situation. And then the degree of cooperation at seven is the highest level of cooperation, like um, voluntary unification into one nation. So in, in, in his event uh, database, uh, he has more than 2,500 events. And this is the distribution of the events that you can see in this figure, that uh, minus seven and plus seven, there are no events uh, like such extreme cases historically. So historical, water conflict and cooperation database shows that there were no um, water war or there were no uh, unification between the two states. And such extreme uh, cannot expect, um, it cannot be expected. So, um, and, and also you can see the interesting point is that the number of cooperation event is much more higher than the number of conflict. But, but of course, there are certain events there were um, high degree of conflicts. And so from this study, it can clearly shown that, of course, um, water conflicts and the extent of water conflict can be higher, but this number is very low and these cases are low. And um, yeah, and so low degree of water conflicts can be expected. So these are the historical distribution of the, of the water conflicts that has been shown um, empirically. Um, 
and and also the another interesting point is that um, there are two uh, time segments here one from the 1948 to 1999 and another from the 2000 to 2000 a recent data set so this two distribution has show, shown the, the important issues the distribution of issues and in this case uh, the left hand side it shows that the historical um, water um, conflict was mainly due to the, um, the the main issue was water quantity or water abstraction is issue which was um, 45 percent but um, recently, this has been shifted, and water quality is is also getting important, and also the infrastructure infrastructure is also has been in, increased, like the uh, construction of dams and uh, reservoirs is also getting an important issue in the water conflict um, situation, and so water quality has also increased. So water quality was six percent, and it now it's, it becomes um, uh, 10%. So uh, now you can see how the um, the imp the issues in terms of issues has also been changing. So now I um, uh, uh, I would like to talk regarding the complexities and need for uh, negotiated approach. So as Larry already mentioned, how complex the water. Um, conflict in terms of shared water uh, resources. Um, this complexity has been characterized by uh, several factors like interconnectedness, uncertainty, feedback, and emergence or self-organization. So let me explain. In this figure, um, you can see how interconnected between the social and ecological components of water resources is. So in the left hand side, you can see the governance dimension, um, the economic value dimension, and, uh, and also um, the social value of water. So these are the social dimensions. So let me give you an example. And then in the right hand side is water quality, water quantity, and uh, ecosystem. And Larry already uh, explained very well how interconnected um, the, th this is. So let me uh, show this figure. This is the Ganges River, and you know, the, the in terms of um, uh, Hindu um, religious, the Ganges is considered highly religious perspectives. So now le let me uh, um, share. So. In this case, the religious value of water can also affect water quality. So because of these religious functions, the, the, the uh, Ganges is also one of the most polluted um, river in the world. So how, um, so you can see how interconnection between uh, this and we need to respect at the same time um, the religious value of the water. At the, um, on the other hand, we need to, um, consider the water quality. Similarly, the asset or economic value perspectives. For example, um, for in order to create hydropower, we need to construct dams, but this can also affect um, water quantity in the downstream, but also um, uh, ecosystem uh, perspective. So the, they are highly interconnected and, and um, so, and also this creates feedback um, and also uncertainty. So in terms of uncertainty, you know, the uh, climate change of course creates highly uncertainty, but also uncertainty of information between countries. So one country, uh, spe specifically in the developing country context where um, the, the democracy is not so strong in terms of, in that case, even the, um, the um, uncertainty of information from one country to another country create major conflicts. I will, ex I will explain this in, in explaining the Brahmaputra case. So you can see how complex the situation of this um, interconnectedness and also Larry mentioned the self-organization um, self or emergence. For example, how the um, relationship between powers like uh, the uh, while uh, Larry was explaining the um, the the, the uh, power dynamics between uh, Nepal India and 
China. So once the uh, the Nepal and India um, were interacting in that case, the power dynamics was imbalanced. Then when the China came into the um, um, came into the um, field, then you know the how the uh, power dynamics can shift. So it can create emergence um, uh, emergence behavior of the power dynamics. So then can conventional scientific approach address this challenge? This conventional scientific approach is mainly positivist science. You know, um, it is mainly uh, focused on data and more value focused. I think conventional scientific approach can't address this kind of complex problems. And so uh, we need uh, to manage uh, value difference among the stakeholders than traditional value focused approach. And that's why um, the, the question is, how can we better address such complex boundary crossing water problems? So then it, it comes the idea that besides value focused approach, besides positive science, we need a negotiated approach that blends science and policy. And here it comes the idea of water diplomacy, um, where Larry, me, and um, another colleague from Tufts are working in this direction. So um, now I, I would like to focus on the empirical context in the Brahmaputra uh, river basin. So as I already shared, um, the Brahmaputra is um, originates in the Tibet Himalaya, uh, which is part of China. And, um, and, and then it uh, enters into the India um, and then in the downstream uh, Bangladesh. The whole of Bhutan is also part of Brahmaputra river basin because some um, distributaries are falling in the main channel of the Brahmaputra from uh, Bhutan. So uh, here you can see the distribution of the area. So China shares more than 50% of the 51% of the area. Uh, India shares 33%. Uh, uh, Bangladesh and Bhutan shares uh, nearly 8%. So um, here, here is the elevation and length of the uh, river. Just I am showing kind of physical aspect of the Brahmaputra. So since the um, Tibet Himalaya, the, 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 in, uh, the Chinese portion, um, the, the Brahmaputra travels more than 1600 uh, kilometer um, before entering to in India. And then uh, from India to um, Bangladesh, it's, it's about another 10, 100 or an, uh, 1000 kilometer. And then it, um, it goes to the Bay of Bengal. So in terms of uncertainty, uh, I, I tried to model this uh, recently. And this is based on the multiple um, uh, global models, global hydrological models. So here the red is the observed um, observed research data for last uh, 40 years. And these are the modeled um, data during this observation period. So you can see how uncertain different model pro provides for, for different months. And specifically during the during the wet period, the model, most of the model provides underestimation. So we cannot rely on the, so the, here the main point is the modeling outcome is also highly uncertain and different models provide different um, outcome for, for um, um, uh, projecting the future uh, river flow. And besides this um, physical aspect, there are also theories uh, regarding um, interactions among the uh, among the parties, and so most upstream countries try to follow this absolute territorial sovereignty. Uh, Larry already mentioned that, and um, the most downstream countries try to follow the absolute territorial integrity because they try to consider this 
the whole basin wide approach their main motto but there are also limited territorial sovereignty and this can be ensured kind of un um, uh, un law that larry was mentioning that um, if the countries can go or can sign the um, um, can can follow this kind of territory um, uh, follow this kind of treaty then this can provide some kind of um, limited sovereignty from the upstream and also can ensure kind of territorial um, integrity also in the uh, downstream but but also the community of interest so these are the four theoretical approaches that um, uh, available in the literature for uh, transboundary interactions so what happens in in the bangladesh uh, in, in the brahmaputra case in the brahmaputra case um, china is the upstream countries and um, and um, and china and india is 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 trying to follow kind of um, china with other downstream countries like try to follow the uh, absolute territorial sovereignty for example um, china is trying to build dams unilaterally without uh, interacting with the with the um, the downstream countries but also china is planning to consider uh, the um, uh, big water transfer project from the west to the east uh, for reducing their uh, um, water scarcity because you know um, china is one of the water scarce country specifically in the eastern part of the country so they try to uh, build this uh, big water transfer projects without considering the uh, the downstream relationships so what india is trying to follow india is trying to consider the um, sometimes territorial sovereignty but also um, with china they try to consider the territorial integrity like um, they have uh, multiple relationship and this creates uh, conflict and in terms of bangladesh in the downstream they try to follow the territorial integrity because they prefer um, whole of basin approach and they consider this, that this is their right to get water from the upstream so this creates a significant level of conflict among the countries and so um, the, 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 here i try to uh, summarize men as stakeholders and their interests for for china the main interest is the hydropower water transfer project uh, for india the their main uh, interest is the um, hydropower and water um, transfer pro projects and this interest affecting downstream in um, bangladesh because the main um, concerns for bangladesh is the flood and water scarcity um, salinity in the uh, downstream and sea level rise um, in, in the uh, downstream. So uh, once China go for the hydropower and water transfer projects, that affects significantly to their concern in the uh, downstream. But but also this is very highly complex because the Indian states has also their own. Um, interests and this creates conflict within india and also uh, overall um um basins because you know the indian water management they provide um, authority to the indian states for managing the water resources so um uh, within uh, for example in the northeastern um, um states uh, like the Arunachal and Assam, they have the conflict between the two states. For example, the um, Assam state is highly concerned with the hydropower development in the Arunachal, in the upstream of Arunachal. So this creates huge conflicts between the Indian states and total um, geopolitical situation among this uh, complex um multiple um stakeholders creates uh, major conflicts uh, in the in the brahmaputra so here i was mentioning the water transfer projects and you know the th these are the planned um, 
or proposed route for um, uh, water conflicts in, in um, China, that China is building um, water transfer projects and this clears concerns to the, to the downstream in, the, uh, uh, in India and also in, the, uh, in Bangladesh. Um, here, um, India is also planning to, to consider, besides hydropower, they also are trying to consider the water transfer projects uh, for reducing water scarcity in their central um, Ganges basin, but also in the southern, uh, um, to, to reduce the water scarcity, they plan to develop this uh, large water transfer pro projects in, uh, in India. So, and, and also these are the um, hydropower, um, uh, situation in, in the um, Brahmaputra uh, river basin. So these are the source of conflicts, and there is no um, the, there is no transboundary um, um, multilateral agreement or negotiation. Only bilateral agreements exist between several countries because the basin-wide development might not be feasible in this um, area, and no countries like the powerful countries, Bangladesh uh, as a downstream, as uh, the, they, they try to follow the, um, uh, the, the, the sovereignty of integrity, uh, not uh, the, the integrity concept. So Bangladesh would like to go for the basinoid approach, but India and China would like to go for um, bilateral agreement in order to, um, um, to uh, maintain their um, authority with, with the other uh, neighboring countries. And that's the main, main uh, problem. Even th there is no uh, water sharing uh, mechanisms among the countries. So th this, uh, um, th this is a highly um, um, complex situation, whether the transboundary cooperation can be feasible or not. And um, and also in the Bangladesh context, there is um, water scarcity during the dry season. And this also creates concerns um, with the upstream development activities that I mentioned. So now I, um, I um, would like to focus briefly how the uh, resolution of the problems can be feasible. And here I wanted to mention the theoretical approach that recently conducted by the uh, Shafiqul Aslam and Choudhury, who mentioned that in order to resolve transboundary water conflicts, three conditions need to uh, meet. One is the active recognition of interdependence. So what do we mean by active recognition of interdependence? So in order to um, create transboundary cooperation um, feasible, the first condition is required is to um, um, consider that all the parties need to consider that they are interdependent with each other. If this is not uh, explicitly recognized, then this transboundary cooperation might not be feasible. Let me uh, share um, here some physical aspect. Here I try to analyze um, water flow in three locations. One at the, before entering into the India, um, the, the, the Chinese border of the river flow. And then uh, before entering into the Bangladesh, there is a discharge station. I try to assess the historical uh, water flow amount. And, and also in um, Bangladesh at the uh, downstream, how the, um, uh, how much uh, river flow is uh, uh, available uh, in terms of not the no, no, not the modeled river flow but measured uh, river flow because I believe that modeled um, river flow cannot provide the, the uh, is highly uncertain and the the results might not be uh, feasible. So as you can see in this hydrograph, the the, the um, the blue line show, uh, shows the uh, river flow at China before entering into the India. And this um, green is the uh, downstream river flow at Bangladesh. And this is uh, the, the um, uh, 
the purple color is showing the uh, river flow uh, at the uh, at um, the bangladesh border in the india so what is happening here the china is sharing 51% of the total area but the share of the um, water flow the the china is producing very less amount of water only 12 uh, billion cubic meter which is 8% uh, flow of the indian um, indian discharge station so the indian discharge station at the uh, pandu the the the, the, the uh, so what i mean that the 8% eight, eight flow is coming from china to the, to the indian station at the, the uh, downstream and 7% of bangladesh flow is coming from china so this is very little amount is coming from the china but uh, you know the india is producing the 89% um, of total water flow in bangladesh so here you can see how dependency is so if china take uh, even 50% of the water from the from the channel the the river flow um, the contribution of chinese part is very low but the 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 if, if, if we now see the media coverage between india and china the india is always claiming that the chinese withdrawal of water is affecting their water scarcity but you know with the physical meaning of this this has very little uh, relevance so this is kind of political statement that also creates kind of artificial environment in, you know in terms of um, uh, water ne negotiation so um, then the second condition that for um, creating an, an um, uh, resolution of such complex problem the second condition is mutual value creation through ne negotiation is, is very important so what does it mean um, that means in this case four countries need to negotiate and in order to create a basinoid development of course each of these four parties will benefit from this negotiation otherwise the negotiation might not work and this can be uh, so in that case might be the water issue um, only water issue might not be the um, uh, might not resolve the problem so we need to bring other issues and we need to create more value and that can um, satisfy multiple parties to uh, negotiate so without benefit from uh, so um, if china go for a negotiation they must need to see their benefits otherwise the negotiation might not work and similarly for other parties uh, is true for this and then the third condition is for adaptive governance through learning so this needs to be um, kind of um, larry, uh, larry was mentioning that the most treaty was signed and then after 50 years they try to see um, the, the how how the um, this adaptiveness can be incorporated so without considering this this adaptive adaptiveness for example I can give an example in the Ganges Treaty, Bangladesh and India signed the treaty, and then uh, th this treaty is going to over in 2025. But there is no um, clause how the future um, flow will look like and how the climate change will change the um, river flow. They, they considered that this the river flow will constant, and they shared the amount considering this constant uh, river flow so they didn't they didn't consider the changes of the flow through considering the human and and um, uh, climatic sense and so th this kind of even though this treaty is signed but the, for in, in order to effectiveness of the treaty this after after signing the treaty the this might not resolve the problems and the treaty or transboundary negotiation might be stopped at some Point. So these three conditions is very important, and so for um, resolving the um, conflicts, this mutual benefit for the transboundary um, extent in the transboundary context in 
Brahmaputra. So here I consider the um, benefits from the river, benefits to the river, and benefits because of the river and benefits beyond the river. So this concept is taken from the Gray and Sadok, who considered this mutual benefit um, uh, for the transboundary water negotiation. So uh, in the uh, case of benefits from the river, there is um, uh, the, there is high likelihood that the upstream countries would like to go for the hydropower development, and this can be a um, great opportunity for creating benefits among the multiple countries in um, China, India, Bangladesh, and Bhutan, because you know water, energy, food nexus creates an um, an, an environment that this. Um, as, as our approach of creating more value, and this can create more value to the negotiation table because you know the hydropower development and the benefit sharing can um, can provide opportunities to other um, countries who are not producing hydropower, and this can create kind of negotiation in in the um, uh, in the um, Brahmaputra river basin, but also risk management. You know, uh, this, um, the downstream countries is, um, is, um, is, is uh, having flood and water scarcity risks. And they are, um, uh, uh, in terms of institutional management, they can share this management aspect in the upstream countries, and this can also create an opportunity to become uh, to create a um, uh, effective negotiation, but also benefit uh, to the river. For example, biodiversity conservation and increasing storage for um, creating joint reservoirs, um, and that can provide an opportunity to to create benefits to the uh, river. But also because of the river, if the countries can um, go from their own right-based um, uh, argument to the interests, and then, then they can sh share the, their interests, then this can also create an opportunity for reducing uh, cost for other uh, purposes. For example, these countries can share inland water transport facilities, and this can um, reduce um, extra costs for transporting, um, uh, yeah, transporting the, the uh, equipment. But also beyond the river, they can. There are some initiatives like China is creating Belt Road Initiative, and um, they, they would like to consider the um, some um, seaport in. Bangladesh. So this kind of interactions can also um, help that is beyond the river and that can create opportunity to, to, um, uh, to uh, resolve the conflicts in the Brahmaputra. But what I am planning to consider here for um, as the enabling conditions doesn't meet in the Brahmaputra river basin and there is no uh, interdependencies among the countries. There is no mutual benefit sharing approach exists. So what would be the initial um, uh, interve intervention that can create an environment to, um, uh, to, to create some, some kind of agreement that can be effective in practice? So what I am pl planning to do is kind of uh, Satam house rule or devising seminar and devising seminar is um, uh, mainly initiated at the Harvard at, uh, by um, Professor Roser Fisher, but also Larry was adopting this um, devising seminar approach for creating initial environment that can um, create a resolution of the problem and it can create an um, environment that can resolve uh, the, that can initiate the problem that can, goes to the uh, resolution. So uh, devising seminar is an off the record facilitated workshop that brings um, multiple stakeholders um, that comes in their um, personal capacity, but not the official capacity. And this is very highly 
confidential and the the uh, and this is not the binding agreement instead this is the the different um, officials can come in the meeting and they jointly discuss how the resolution of the meeting uh, the resolution of the um, problem can be resolved and this can create a document that can be uh, that can help um, uh, creating an environment that can be leads to uh, a resolution of the transboundary problems that cannot be discussed in their official capacity because of the strategic issues. So this is the approach that I am planning to consider. And for the mutual gain uh, negotiation, I am trying to consider this joint fact finding and mutual gain uh, kind of role play simulation approach that I, I plan to consider. So here I give an outline what I um, consider transboundary water problem is and how the resolution of the problem can be feasible. So th this is the summary outline and this is the last slide that I'm going to show. So first I try to understand how complex the problem is and if the problem is complex for the transboundary shared water um, resources, we must need to um, understand this complex uh, problems through complexity lens. Uh, for example, um, network analysis or social ecological system in terms of theory, but empirically as an based model development. But if the problem is not complex, then we can easily go for the conventional scientific investigation like physical scientific approach or um, um, uh, yeah, the causality based reasoning can work for resol uh, resolving that problem. But if the problem is complex, then through complexity science or um, uh, complex investigation, we can understand the, whether the enabling, enabling condi condition is present or not. So the three enabling condition that I mentioned. So if the enabling condition is present, then we can go for the negotiation and that works for resolution of the problem. But in most cases in transboundary context, the negotiation, uh, the enabling condition doesn't exist. And in that case, we need, we need to create an enabling condition. And I think the devising seminars that I um, um, considered here can be a way to create those en enabling condition. Once we can create enabling condition, then we can go for a, a negotiation. And I think that, that helps for resolving the transboundary water conflicts conflicts so here i try to summarize here so the, the extent of water conflicts might not lead to the water war but of course it creates with interacting with other problems other geopolitical problems it can also lead to huge conflicts and the transboundary water problems is highly complex and such complexity cannot be addressed through conventional scientific approach and we must need to consider negotiated approach that blends science and policy and um, um, and the, the, the conflicts that I showed here at Brahmaputra case is highly complex and um, this resolution of the problem uh, needs a clear um, and very um, systematic investigation and um, uh, for example the devising seminar can be an initial um, point that can um, provide intervention for creating an environment that can resolve transboundary conflicts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your, your talk. And I think there is one question here in the chat, which you partially answered already, but I would like to read out anyways, because uh, Professor Giupponi said that Larry emphasized the importance of context. Do you think models or other quantitative approaches may allow us to implement systematic and robust analysis of different cases and possibly support the decision processes you are studying? You have, as I said, partially answered this already, but maybe you would like to tackle this question more directly. Yeah, um, uh, thank you, uh, Carlo, for um, asking this uh, question. As in the negotiation table, we need to have multiple parties, including scientists, 
and of course the systematic scientific investigation is needed and um, and this will of course help generating um, the the understanding the problem but um, and, and and of course we need science for for uh, th th this but uh, of, uh, as you um, can imagine uh, the the different stakeholders viewpoint is different and even they um, do not agree with the scientific principles so they here the main complexities is to um, how to um, address this stakeholders um, viewpoint is the is the uh, also is the key issue and that's why i believe that besides science of course we need science and besides science with uh, with this kind of uh, negotiation uh, skill is very important for uh, addressing this kind of um, yeah the the diverse um, uh, strong opinions of the stakeholders Okay, I was waiting for maybe Barbara to mention other questions in the chat, but I think we are already late and uh, it was nice to be late today <laughs> because we have a lot of, uh, uh, got a lot of stimuli for, for our uh, work and uh, exploring uh, water, at least for me, from a, a, a different perspective uh, and uh, I raised that question because uh, we wrote something on the global environmental change, as you may know, recently trying to even have a sort of uh, uh, future projections in terms of, of conflicts. But of course, uh, these are deep, quite debated approaches and uh, you may trust them or not, you will consider them useful or not. But then eventually, as you know, I'm very much interested in, in, the, in, the, in the processes as you are. And uh, it would be nice also to understand to what extent uh, uh, these combination of quantitative and, and, and qualitative uh, approaches uh, uh, can really improve the state of the art, which I think is our, our ambition. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's time to, to, to thank you, uh, Larry and Danny Mesh, for being with us today. It was very nice. Uh, it was a nice celebration of uh, the World Water Day. I hope we will be other opportunities. I'm sure we will have other opportunities since we have a joint project, but I hope it will be soon. Huh? And, uh, and also, I hope I, we can uh, reiterate our uh, invitation to come here and, uh, and spend some time with us, if you can, soon. I hope so. I hope so. OK, so thank you again. Huh? Yeah. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Please feel free, any of you who are working on these subjects, to be in touch. You can reach me just my last name, Suskind, S-U-S-S-K-I-N-D, at mit.edu. I'm glad to consider uh, further conversation with anybody who wants to pick up on these questions. Thanks again. Thank you. So bye-bye, yeah. everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Carlo. Ciao. Thanks, thanks, Barbara. Bye-bye.